Well, hello everyone, and we now are leaving the time of uh, the Renaissance and entering the time of Baroque. The term itself was given to the period later by the 18th century classicists who felt that uh, the period of the 17th century, the art was irregular. And um, the word irregular, it seems it comes from Portuguese, such as Baroque pearls, irregular pearls. Uh, the term stuck, as all those misnomers are the misnomers, and uh, now we have it. Well, by the end of the uh, 16th century, the world has changed entirely. The century itself was um, as horrific in its religious atrocities as it was extraordinary in its um, discoveries. Uh, the whole new world was discovered, and as a result, man's attitude towards um, himself, herself, uh, uh, the environment, uh, religion, uh, politics, everything had changed totally. And uh, as such, the 17th century opened with a whole new outlook on life. Also, by the end of the 16th century, in Catholic countries, in the majority of Catholic countries, absolutism had established itself. And, um, and this absolutism, uh, whether religious or secular, had to confront uh, the Protestantism. And as such, it used art uh, and art's emotional potential to the uh, to the full because again towards the end of the 16th century um, after all the uh, artistic experiments and discoveries also of art um, essentially no problems of uh, representation or composition were were there for a diligent artist so there were academies to study art there were schools to study art and so now the difference between various schools and various areas will essentially be determined by the demands of, uh, of patrons. Uh, and there will be a tremendous difference. Uh, we call the 17th, well, into the 18th century, Baroque. But under that title, um, we find extremely different uh, types of art and we'll attempt to look at them um, now. Well, first, uh, first to the map. What you see here is the layout, the distribution of uh, religion in Europe after the religious wars. And uh, uh, you may remember Martin Luther in the early 16th century proclaimed uh, his uh, Protestant rebellion against Catholicism. It uh, was quite successful and at first, uh, great areas of Northern Europe, uh, Northern Europe, Western Europe, uh, went over to Protestantism and it took uh, a while for the Catholic Church to realize how serious the danger actually was. But once they did, they launched their own so-called counter-reformation, whereby they um, went against Protestantism in the attempt to win a number of countries back, which they did. Ultimately, uh, ultimately, southern Germany went back to Catholicism, as well as Poland, Hungary, um, Transylvania, Spain never left. But they did lose uh, all the north, whether it's Norway or Sweden, uh, England became, uh, embraced the Anglican uh, Protestantism, which was sort of a compromise halfway between Catholicism and uh, Protestantism, and uh, once you have your PowerPoints, you'll be able to look at the map and see um, see the distribution. That doesn't mean that in Catholic countries there were no pockets of uh, Protestantism or vice versa. Of course, it all existed, as you see here. But again, so this time now, Catholicism began to use art for its maximum effect, for its um, maximum dramatic effect. Uh, to Italy we go again, uh, and um, perhaps one of the greatest uh, artists in Italy at the time was uh, Michelangelo Merisi Caravaggio. As much as he disdained the uh, 
classical art or the art of classical antiquity or for that matter uh, the art of uh, Raphael or Leonardo. He never ever forgot that his first name was Michelangelo and therefore we will see some references in his art to the great uh, Michelangelo. He did not live long but um, but in his short life, not only he managed to fulfill his genius, but he also established a record of lawlessness uh, that was rarely equaled in, um, in the history of art. And um, that was only surpassed in the history of brigandage. He, um, he just uh, preferred to live uh, on the fringes of uh, respectability. Uh, he had um, a violent temper, which is all the more astonishing considering that his brush was always in perfect control. We have a number of um, uh, his self-portraits. Here is one of them, and he, uh, here he depicts himself as, uh, uh, as the young Bacchus. Uh, he is submerged in darkness. Uh, this style of painting will be called tenebrism, from the word tenebra, which is, uh, which is a shadow. And uh, his art will look very much as if it is on a stage lit up by sharp lights for this incredible dramatic effect. Um, Bacchus clearly was his patron saint. Uh, because uh, Bacchus is god of merriment and drinking and uh, carousing and all the inordinate behavior that, um, that Caravaggio devoted his life to. Here he is portraying himself as god with um, a garland of autumn leaves on his uh, face. He uh, seemed to have had a round face with very pronounced eyebrows as you see here, and what he does in this painting is essentially inviting us to a banquet because uh, it is extremely personal. He is holding a glass of red wine in his left hand, extending it to us. And in the glass, in the wine itself, one sees these concentric circles that appear in the glass as the glass moves. So the action is in fact immediate. He is just extending it to us. His hand is also on, um, on this knot, on his uh, robe, uh, which is suggestive, but then a lot of his art is very suggestive. And in front of him is a beautiful still life, a beautiful basket with, uh, with fruit, some of which fruit is rotten, in fact. And um, this type of art will be called uh, vanitas. In other words, uh, what he is telling us is this is this beautiful fruit. It is still edible, but it is already rotting. Therefore, carpe diem, in other words, seize the moment and enjoy the moment while it still lasts. Because with the rotting of fruit, with the rotting of everything, essentially, including our lives, um, one must enjoy what one has. Uh, and in this respect, uh, this is quite remarkable, the painting. He was a young man. Uh, well, he was a young man when he died. He was, I think, about 37. Uh, yes. And um, as I said, he has a perfect control of his brush. The brush strokes do not show. Everything is done in perfect modeling in space, even though that space is rather dark. And he will uh, continue to do his self-portrait, interestingly enough, after uh, the Bacchus that we had just seen, who was a healthy, robust Bacchus. Uh, there's another one that uh, he painted self-portrait as a sick Bacchus, as if in uh, maintaining that same idea that today we are healthy, tomorrow we may not be, just as the fruit. And uh, in this case he seems as if he, have, 
he has just gotten perhaps out of bed. He has sat himself at, uh, at the table. We are sitting on the other side of the table. We are still very much the participants in his life. He is wearing the same um, garment and, uh, and there's that tie that he was ready to untie for us in the previous painting, but now it is, uh, it is closed, he's not well, and he portrays himself as such. He is still very much Bacchus. Uh, the grapes suggest that because, uh, well, Bacchus, the god of wine, therefore the god of grapes. And uh, he is still himself, even though he is ill. And he is still another, and this is a boy with a basket of fruit, and the boy still looks very much like Caravaggio. It is pretty much the same basket of fruit that we saw in the previous painting, and here he is hugging this fruit to his chest as if, uh, as if hugging life itself and uh, appreciating life itself. He was not a sculptor, Caravaggio, but by doing something like this, uh, he invoked the principles of sculpture because in sculpture one can walk around this sculpture when the sculpture is freestanding and see different aspects of that sculpture. Well, one cannot do it in painting except uh, one can. And what he does here, it is the same boy, perhaps himself, uh, because the face looks very similar to what we had just seen, and he presents himself as several uh, boys, and he calls the painting the musicians, and therefore we, saw, we see him uh, as he is uh, remote, then he see, we see him up front, we see him uh, from his back, and here still is another aspect. Uh, the brilliant colors are employed, he is still wearing the same garment, in this case the uh, uh, the knot, the tie of the garment, is actually in his back, almost inviting us now to uh, untie it. Uh, the, uh, the boys are singing and uh, playing the uh, lute in this case. There is still grapes, so there is still this bacchanalia, so to speak, that goes on. Uh, the space is very compressed in this case. It's just, uh, it's just these four figures in a very tight space sitting sort of on top of um, one another. Um, and there is um, a clear diagonal that goes through the composition and we'll see more of this diagonal in the Baroque art as we saw circles and triangles and um, golden rectangles in Renaissance. We'll see a lot of very dramatic diagonals in Baroque art. And now we go to Rome. This chapel is called the Cantarelli Chapel and it's located in San Luigi dei Francesi in the church in Rome that was dedicated to Saint Louis, uh, the, uh, the king of um, France and earlier King of France. And Caravaggio now received this commission because he had acquired um, some very influential patrons in Rome. Um, well, we saw other chapels. We saw that uh, Giotto, in fact, painted a whole church. And then we saw Masaccio in Florence also painting a chapel. So it was uh, quite common to, uh, uh, to hire an artist to uh, to paint a chapel and in this case here is Caravaggio. In this case these are not frescoes, these are oil paintings on canvas. And we will look at um, uh, this painting in particular. It is called The Calling of Saint Matthew. It is perhaps one of the most famous works that Caravaggio did and it is um, dedicated to Saint Matthew. Saint Matthew, who, according to tradition, was a tax collector during Christ's um, days, and uh, being a tax collector was the lowest of the low. One uh, did not respect a tax collector because he would go around knocking on people's doors and demanding of them to, uh, to pay him the last of uh, their earnings. And very often these tax collectors would keep a lot of it to themselves rather than pay the full, the full amount to the authorities. But Christ uh, was the man of the people and he went to the people to look for his, uh, 
to look for his apostles. And in a way, Caravaggio must have uh, identified with him because, well, so was uh, Caravaggio. He uh, not only he drew everything from um, living models, but uh, he was a rebel. He was a rebel in life and he was a rebel in uh, art. And his models, those living models that he drew, he chose from the people. So just as Christ uh, chose his apostles from the people, so Caravaggio chose his models from the people. And here what we see is Christ entering a very lowly uh, hole in the wall, essentially a tavern, and we almost don't see Christ because Christ is in the background, hidden by the figure of Saint Peter. Saint Peter was one of the first disciples. And Christ now enters this tavern accompanied by Saint Peter, and he extends his uh, hand. And this hand is now borrowed from Sistine ceiling. It is borrowed from Michelangelo, from the creation of Adam, and here, uh, as I had said earlier, uh, Caravaggio is quoting Michelangelo, but also reminding us that his name, his first name, is also Michelangelo. And with this hand, Christ identifies Saint Matthew. And here he is. Saint Matthew is in the middle. He is surrounded by uh, youths and older men, all dressed in very gaudy clothes because, well, he is in the company of uh, tax collectors like himself uh, who are able to buy expensive clothes uh, with the uh, ill money that, uh, that they gain by they don't have taste and therefore the clothes, even though they're rich clothes, they're also gaudy clothes. And we see him uncertain, St. Matthew. He sort of, he, he points to himself but if we look at the painting, it's uncertain he's pointing at himself or he's pointing at the man next to him. It's sort of almost as if saying, is it me that you want and uh, why do you want me? Because, of course, he is shocked. Nobody wants tax collectors. Everyone despises them. But yet here he creates a new man out of a tax collector just as uh, God created uh, a man out of mud in the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So this is the context. As to the, uh, the way of painting, as I said, extremely dramatic, uh, the scene is drowned in darkness, in tenebrism. Uh, there is a window which, well, it's a traditional symbol of revelation. But in this case, Revelation is covered with wax paper, with oil paper that was used uh, at the time, very often instead of glass, because glass was um, expensive. Nevertheless, Christ enters and with him enters light. So light does not come from the window, light comes with Christ as he enters the tavern and light illuminates the scene. Uh, these two people, the youth and the older men, are completely absorbed in their money counting and uh, it's just the three here who are noticing the entry. And one of them, again, looks like Caravaggio and uh, looks like his, another one of his uh, self-portraits. Um, extremely dramatic. Again, there's no background, there's no need for background. Saint Matthew was enveloped in darkness, in darkness of his profession, in the darkness of his ignorance, and now he, in fact, will be enlightened with um, Christ's revelation. And this is how it is conveyed um, here. So, in a sense, uh, this is the supernatural that is conveyed in rational terms uh, and uh, not only that but it's also given dramatic tangibility. Uh, I mean the man was a genius and uh, he, he changed the course of art. He will, uh, he will influence a great number of people, a great number of other artists and just as art was never the same after Michelangelo Buonarroti, uh, art will never be the same after uh, Caravaggio.
Uh, here is a close-up, just so that you see how his brush works, how, how very real everything is. Uh, we can probably tell which coins um, these are. So there's, uh, there's this poignancy in, uh, in his portrayal of these people. Interestingly, uh, even though he preferred to portray the men of uh, the street, they themselves did not much appreciate his art because, well, they were used to Christ's in glory. They were used to walking into a church and seeing celestial apparition. They did not really want to see themselves in religious paintings. They wished to be transported. Um, and, uh, well, speaking of transportation, here's still another chapel and this is called the Chirasi Chapel, and it's also in Rome, in Santa Maria del Popolo, and there too Caravaggio was asked to, uh, to submit paintings, and we'll look at, um, at this one, right here. Uh, this is the Revelation of St. Paul, the Conversion of St. Paul, and this one is the crucifixion of St. Peter. St. Peter was crucified upside down because he did not want to uh, to be compared to his lord and master, he wanted to abase himself and as a result when the time came for him to be executed, he in fact asked to be cruc crucified upside down. And this is what this painting is about. Uh, we are looking at this one and this is the conversion of uh, Saint Paul. Here again he transforms the scene, the story here that Saint Paul who worked for the Temple of Jerusalem, who worked for the high priest, uh, was hired by him to go around and persecute this um, new sect of uh, Christians, and which is what he did, but then one day traveling from Jerusalem north to Damascus, he fell off his horse and uh, had a revelation. And by the time he came to, uh, he saw the light and he became Christian himself. It is possible that uh, the man Paul was in epileptic, uh, so it's very possible that he had one of those epileptic fits. But then in Christian religion it came um, about as uh, a great revelation. It is, um, and it was portrayed many times in uh, Renaissance art because it was one of the most um, common and uh, favorite topics, uh, but uh, in all the cases that the topic was portrayed, Paul, of course, was the central figure, whereas here he is not. In fact, the central figure here is the horse. Here is the horse, and the horse occupies, uh, what, uh, two-thirds of the painting. Uh, first, we see the horse. It's only later that we see this figure who is done in extreme foreshortening, who is lying on the ground with his uh, uh, arms outstretched, uh, receiving God's uh, revelation. Uh, there's also his um, servant, and it seems that neither the servant nor uh, the horse, in fact, understand what is happening and why is this man now lying on the, on the ground while he was very happily riding the horse uh, up until now. So there's not so much what's portrayed here is the revelation of St. Paul as uh, the spectacle of incomprehension on the part of uh, his servant and uh, his horse, in fact, the horse is being very, very careful not to step on the, uh, this fellow. And uh, the servant is looking at him patiently, uh, waiting for him to get up and perhaps continue on his way. So the drama here is not so much in Christian revelation as in human surprise. And uh, that's what Caravaggio portrays. Again, everything is very much drowned in uh, darkness. Not only it's night, but there's also drama and a great deal of dramatic diagonals. Uh, the diagonals are established by Paul's uh, uh, 
arms here, the diagonals are established by a horse's, by a, a, a rear leg of a horse. Uh, in fact, it's almost as if the, uh, the Renaissance triangle is turned upside down, as you see it, um, as you see it here, and everything, the devil is in the detail, every little detail is conveyed with the most astonishing accuracy. So here we have sort of what, what we really do have a revelation of is this uh, psychological shock and um, the revelations of uh, psychological forces of uh, good and evil. What is good? What is evil? Can a man really just convert uh, overnight? from something that he held dear to a completely different attitude. Uh, and all of it very much is conveyed in this painting. And here's still another, and this, in this case it is Judith with Holofernes, except this time Judith is in the process of beheading Holofernes. If you remember, uh, in the beginning of the semester, we looked at the Botticelli Judith with the head of Holofernes. And this is how Botticelli chose to depict her in the end of the 15th century. She is a lovely maiden. Uh, behind her is her servant with the head of Holofernes. The deed is done. It is complete. Uh, there is uh, no emotion. Uh, what we see is beautiful grace and movement. Not the case here. Uh, her face expresses emotion. She holds her dagger at an arm's length while she's holding Holofernes himself by his hair and cutting his head off. We also see a servant who is waiting with a bag to put the head in. Everything submerged in darkness, except there's this dramatic red cloth. It's a theater. We are watching a theater. And uh, the curtain just uh, went up to reveal the scene. And, uh, and we are horrified because the drama is there, right in front of us. It's happening as we speak just as we were participants in Caravaggio's Bacchanalia when he, when he portrayed himself, when he did his own portraits. So here as well, we are witnessing the event. It's very much in our faces. And therefore, the comparison is very telling. Uh, there is about um, 150 years difference between uh, Botticelli and Caravaggio and what a difference. And it shows not only a difference in style of painting, but the difference in conception of men, of, he, of the world he lives in. He uh, lived on the fringe of respectability and it just so happened he killed a man in Rome uh, uh, during a tennis match. So he had to escape Rome and then he found himself in Naples then, um, then he found himself in Sicily, in Messina, and finally in Malta. And Malta was the home of the Knights of St. John. And so welcome was he in Malta that he was actually made a Knight of uh, St. John. It didn't last. He again got into a scrape of one, uh, of one type or another, had then to escape uh, Malta, was already on the way back to Rome uh, with the papal pardon in his pocket when he contracted um, a disease, uh, malaria, and died on his way to Rome. Truly tragic, well, <laughs> tragic certainly for the history of art. But while in Malta, he also painted. And um, here's still in uh, the chapel, it's an oratory in the cathedral of um, St. John in Malta. Well, these are the Knights of St. John, so the cathedral is that of St. John. And there he paints uh, a very famous uh, beheading of John the Baptist. And again, as is always the case with Caravaggio, he paints 
he takes a completely different approach to, uh, to interpreting the scene. If you remember, again, uh, in the uh, 15th century, this time in the, in the early 15th century, Donatello portrayed the uh, beheading of John the Baptist, and he portrayed it in a way that will be repeated throughout the 15th century, and usually it was portrayed as a feast of Herod, because Herod, if you remember, did not wish to uh, execute John the Baptist, whom he kept prisoner, but Herodia, who had reasons to, uh, to hate John the Baptist, convinced her daughter Salome to dance beautifully at a feast. And uh, Salome did that, and indeed, so lovely was the dance that Herod uh, promised her anything she wanted. And Salome, in this case, wished for the head of John the Baptist. Uh, Herod uh, couldn't go back on his word. Uh, sent executioners to, to the prison where John the Baptist was held, and John the Baptist was decapitated. But the scene is usually portrayed as a feast of Herod, and here we have it, with the head of John the Baptist actually brought into the feast, and then uh, this uh, gave the opportunity to artists to convey different emotions, horror, on the face of some, even uh, on the face of Herod, complete indifference uh, in the face of Herodia, and, uh, uh, and then Salome still in a dancing mode. So that's how usually it was portrayed, as a head already being brought into the feast. Caravaggio, as always, chooses a completely different approach. And his approach is actually to go into the jail with the executioner and watch the beheading, just as we had just watched the beheading of Holofernes by, uh, by Judith. And uh, uh, here we have it. It is jail. We see that it's jail. There are two people right there behind the grate. Uh, and this is the entrance. This is just as they walked in, the entrance, the exit. Uh, no background again, it is darkness, we are still in a theater on the stage witnessing an execution. And uh, it is also good to remember that at that time executions were a public spectacle and uh, it was uh, an entertainment. Uh, they did not have TVs, they did not have their iPhones, uh, and for entertainment people went to watch executions. Uh, so what Caravaggio portrays here is one of those executions and we are the witnesses. Um, the blood is almost invisible, there's some blood here, but there is a very prominent red cloth that is thrown over the back of John the Baptist and this red cloth substitutes for blood. The executioner seems to have his uh, right uh, hand, right arm, behind his back, as if uh, the uh, as if the beheading was not complete and he still needs to kill. So the whole thing is taking place in front of our eyes, and we are not much different from these prisoners who are also fascinated by the deed and who are looking at it. Um, as I said, Caravaggio's approach was always very different. And it did happen a number of times when he submitted his art and it was rejected, uh, but not this. In sculpture, the greatest genius in, uh, again, in Italy, well, actually the world over, at the time, in the uh, 17th century, was uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Born in Naples um, to a father who also was a sculptor, he developed an absolute virtuosity in um, handling marble. Uh, it was said of him that he devoured marble. But, it's, but he wasn't just a sculptor, he was also a brilliant architect, he was a painter, he was a writer. Well, uh, in the 17th century, he was a Renaissance man. And this is um, his um, self-portrait. Uh, he too carved David as still, um, as still a a young man, and a very different David it is. With Michelangelo, David was a Grecian nude. 
poised, intense, alert, but stationary. Not the case with Bernini. With Bernini, David is in the process, just as with Caravaggio, we saw the process of happening, so is with Bernini in his sculptures, we'll be seeing the process of happening. He's not entirely nude, as uh, was the case with Michelangelo, but it seems that he was wearing some sort of a classical uh, corset, which he took off in order to face this giant who is coming towards him. He took off that classical corset, and there it is. It also serves as support for the statue, because marble is extremely heavy, and it is not hollow as bronze is. Therefore, it's a lot heavier even than bronze, if this were done in bronze. And it always needs support just to attach it by, say, two legs would just not be enough. Therefore, support is needed, and here it is. His classical corselet that's, that here serves as support. And he is in the moment of throwing that stone. And the amazing thing is that and his face here, his lips are pursed, his eyebrows um, are connected, he is all in it. Uh, his hair is disheveled, and it seems that Bernini, in fact, uh, uh, was looking at himself in the mirror, held to him by a future pope, as he carved the face and as he expressed it. Uh, there's a tremendous, just a remarkable contrapposto going on. The whole body is twisted, as you see. Uh, his legs are firmly planted on the ground, and uh, the toes are curved around the a rock for, for greater traction, for greater purchase. And his arms go one way as they uh, prepare the sling while his legs are faced the other way. The only thing he has, really, is um, a shepherd's uh, purse, woolly purse, here. And he's not entirely nude. As I said, he has um, a cover. But otherwise, uh, the body is um, in the nude. And the spirit here of absolute resoluteness, the spirit of, uh, uh, of vigor and uh, something that no one had ever seen before and the virtuosity of cutting the marble because all of this is cut out of one piece of marble and the ability to balance marble also in contraposto just as contraposto means the balance of every limb the balance of every muscle and sinew in a human body notwithstanding what uh, position this body takes it all has to look natural, but in the same sort of way, Bernini creates this contraposto in marble, and marble itself balances itself. And this sculpture is of Apollo and Daphne. Apollo was a Greek god, Daphne was a nymph, and Apollo saw her, fell in love with her, wished to possess her. And as he pursued her, Daphne appealed to her father, who was a river god, he was not nearly as important a god, as Apollo and he turned her into a tree and what Bernini does here he is catching the moment when Apollo is in hot pursuit he's almost he's almost there his hands are already touching the nymph's body when this body becomes a bark now Bernini never tired of portraying a human body. He made you forget that you're actually looking at marble because what he did with marble, he, he turned it like Pygmalion, he turned it into human flesh. Um, another story that comes from Greek antiquity of a sculptor Pygmalion who carved a beautiful nude and so beautiful was she that he fell in love with her, appealed to Aphrodite to make her real and Aphrodite granted him his wish. Well, Bernini is a Pygmalion because that's what he does. He turns marble into human flesh. Another thing that he never forgot was um, how sensual human hair is. And that human hair we see here in abundance. 
uh, here it is. Um, Daphne is in the front. Her legs are already becoming roots and her fingers are already becoming branches and leaves, while Apollo, whose face is taken from uh, an antique model, still manages to express surprise. His mouth is half open, he doesn't understand what is, um, what is happening, and uh, the action is right there in front of us. It's, it's both surprise, virtuosity, extraordinary, uh, carving of marble and where even to begin um, to describe uh, Berini's ability with texture. There are all sorts of textures here. There's texture of the bark, there's texture of the rock, texture of the nude, texture of the hair, texture of the leaves and in fact when you see this with your own eyes uh, the leaves are carved with such incredible finesse that the light comes through them and one can see uh, the, uh, um, the design of marble when one looks through those leaves onto, onto the light. It's just, uh, it's just extraordinary. Here you can see the, uh, um, the close-ups of uh, his chisel. And still more. And here, as you walk around, uh, you're just surprised you're surprised every step of the way. And still more. It is located in a beautiful Galleria Borghese and uh, uh, Scipione Borghese was a patron of Bernini and Bernini carved a lot of statues for him and then uh, it is in the palace of Borghese. There are a lot of Berninis there and each one of them is more spectacular than the next. Uh, here is still another there and this is uh, Pluto's abduction of Proserpina, uh, Pluto, the god of the underworld, abducted the daughter of the goddess Demeter. Demeter was not happy about it, as you can imagine. Uh, ultimately, a deal was struck that Proserpina will spend half the time with her mother above ground and uh, half the time uh, with her husband uh, in the underworld and as a result that's when we get the fall and winter is when the Proserpina begins to go back to her husband and then spring and summer is when Proserpina returns um, to her mother Demeter. So we are right now at the time when uh, Proserpina returns to her mother Demeter. But uh, again with Bernini he is uh, capturing the moment of action. And uh, here is this extraordinary Michelangesque, really, body of the, um, of the god of the underworld and a beautiful, beautiful maiden, again, whose flesh is... Uh, uh, Bernini clearly enjoys carving and uh, you can see what he does. Uh, and just what I, what I said earlier, if you forget that it's marble, it's so realistic is the portrayal and so realistic is human contact uh, and here you have it and now we go to, to still another of uh, Bernini works uh, which is perhaps uh, the most famous religious sculpture ever uh, it is also in Rome it is um, in uh, the church of Santa Maria della Victoria and this particular cha chapel is called the Cornaro Chapel because the family, the uh, Cornaro family, commissioned it from Bernini. Well, here he turns the entire chapel into a theater. Uh, we are, in fact, in the theater, and on each side he shows us balconies in the theater where members of the Cornaro family are sitting, talking, watching, participating in what they're seeing right here. And what we're seeing is the, uh, um, the ecstasy of Saint Teresa. Saint Teresa was a 16th century saint in Spain, Saint Teresa of Avila. If the 15th century loved showing the miracles of saints, the 16th century loved uh, showing the ecstasies of saints. And, um, and Saint Teresa, in fact, left her autobiography where she described uh, how 
at the time of her contemplations, uh, she was visited by an angel, and that angel pierced her with a beautiful silver arrow, and as the arrow entered within her body, she felt the ineffable uh, pleasure, pain, the mystery of divine presence. And this is the topic of this sculpture. We see a stage here and with the proscenium, the pediment is broken to reveal the stage. There is a window up there uh, and it's almost as if the divine light comes from that window and the divine light here is expressed through these bronze gilded rays as they envelop Saint Teresa and uh, the angels. So the light, just as Caravaggio depicted light, as light uh, came into the tavern with Christ and made a new person out of Saint Matthew, Bernini does this in sculptural terms, as uh, light falls onto Saint Teresa and uh, transports her into a different world. Here are the, uh, the two balconies. Here they are, with the members of the Coronaro family. And as we see, while uh, on the balcony on, the, on our right, uh, there's one man watching what is happening, and uh, the other three are just involved in their conversation. And here too, there are two men, in fact, that follow what goes on, while the other two are uh, discussing things between each other. And in, uh, in both balconies we see the um, imagery of uh, uh, Renaissance slash Baroque architecture. There's, there are ionic columns, there are coffered ceilings on both sides, and the, the imagery of reality is uh, incomparable. And then we go to the image itself of Saint Teresa. Here are the golden rays, as I said. Here is the proscenium and the broken pediment. Verini loved different textures and um, different stones or so different colored marbles. And here you see red marbles, blue marbles, white marbles, uh, any kind of uh, any kind of stone that he could carve and turned into something completely different. Um, uh, bronze too, he was one of the first sculptors to incorporate different materials in the same sculptural group. Uh, here is the angel and here is Saint Teresa and here we have it. Needless to say, in order to convey psychological uh, divine transportation, uh, very human sexual overtones are introduced here just so that humans could understand divine revelation through their own experiences. Uh, Saint Teresa is here, her legs are apart entirely. Here's her one foot, the other foot we don't see. Her body is covered with very heavy nun's habit and it contrasts beautifully with the um, somewhat uh, with the diaphanous clothes of uh, the angel and while Saint Teresa's face is ecstatic and transported the angel is wearing uh, a light smile as he directs the silver arrow at Saint Teresa's body. So this extraordinary impression, remarkable impression of uh, melting uh, femininity and uh, mystical softness are all incorporated in one sculptural group which is astonishing. As I said, he was also an architect, uh, he was also a painter, he was also a writer. Uh, it is to him that we Oh, this um, baldacchino, which is uh, located in St. Peter's above the entrance uh, into the area where St. Peter's relics are held. So it's called the St. Peter's baldacchino. The twisting columns, uh, he borrows them from uh, 
the stories about the ancient temple in Jerusalem that also had twisting columns. So the, uh, these columns refer us back to the Old Testament. We see bees everywhere and that's because uh, this was commissioned by the family of Barberini and uh, the Barberini family, this, uh, this was uh, um, their shield and a bee was on the Barberini shield and therefore all the art that, uh, all the sculpture that um, Bernini did for the Barberini, they all have little bees. Just as in the um, assistant ceiling, what we saw were acorns because Julius II's uh, last name was del rovere, which means oak. And as a result, we see acorns everywhere on the Sistine um, ceiling. Here we see bees. And here is the close-up, so you can see how it's done. It's, again, just remarkable. Uh, and this is what it looks like when the light comes in. And, uh, well, that's what Catholic Church did. It, uh, it turned their interiors into an absolute spectacle. Whereas in the North, at the same time, well, during the 16th century, all art was destroyed uh, in the name of the Second Commandment, whether the Netherlands or Sweden or England, for that matter. Uh, they all possessed uh, remarkable art from the 15th century, but it was all destroyed, well, most of it. Whereas what Catholic Church does now, it uh, presents uh, its interiors as a heavenly vision. Uh, we also owe to uh, Bernini uh, the arms of uh, St. Peter's. Uh, what he does here, he, uh, he conveys the idea that the Catholic religion embraces its denizens. Uh, it stretches its arms to its denizens. It, uh, it wants to embrace its parishioners. And uh, while the northern interiors are rather forbidding, the uh, interiors in the, of the Catholic Church are absolutely spectacular. And uh, really, it's to Bernini that we owe, the, um, we owe Rome as it looks like today, because his edifices are everywhere, uh, Bernini's and his followers. Uh, churches, the private mansions, the fountains, everywhere. Quite astonishing.